Tonight on KQED Newsroom, we talk with special guest Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff about what she's accomplished in her two terms as leader of a diverse city of nearly half a million people and the work still left to be done. And we'll talk with our panel of reporters about this week's news, which includes the end of death row at San Quentin, single-payer health care legislation, and how reducing poverty helps a baby's brain develop. Plus, we embark on a nighttime safari to discover animals glowing in the dark in this week's look at Something Beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, February 4th, 2022. Hello and welcome to the show. This is KQED Newsroom and I'm Priya David Clemens. We start tonight with an in-depth conversation with Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff, who is beginning her final year in office. Schaff took office in 2015 with an agenda to focus on public safety, education and housing. In the past seven years, she's had a few other issues added to her plate, including a controversial plan to close many of Oakland's public schools, ongoing questions about how the Oakland Police Department is run, and a global pandemic that's especially impacted the vibrant black, brown, and Asian communities of Oakland. Schaff has also tackled some innovative social experiments, including the city's recently launched Guaranteed Income Pilot Project. Joining me now via Skype from Oakland is Mayor Libby Schaff. Mayor Schaff, thank you so much for joining us. You have been a frequent guest on KQED Newsroom since you began your tenure as mayor. We wish we could have had you in studio today. COVID does get in the way of that sometimes, so we're looking at each other across the bay on screens today. But let's take a look at some of those changes that came into place because of what happened during the pandemic, some of the things that were maybe a little more positive that we enjoyed, like the Slow Streets program. Just unfortunately, recently, last week, Oakland's Bicyclist and Pedestrian Advisory Commission said it's going to be dismantling the Slow Streets program. Do you think that's the right thing to do? We're not dismantling it, we're pivoting it to adjust to the current conditions. We are gonna be making many of those slow streets permanent where appropriate, but people are going back to work now. Cars are back on the streets. And so it's not as safe to have the number of slow streets that we rolled out with such urgency at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all dying to get out of our homes but in a socially distanced manner to see our neighbors, but see them safely. And we are not rolling back the flex street. Uh, Oakland is blessed with the best weather in the world. I mean, look yeah. outside right now. And that's why outdoor dining, parklet, really reimagining our public commons, that is here to stay. And we're gonna continue to double down on many of the lessons that we did learn during the pandemic. Let's turn to another topic, the sports front. We have so many sports fans here. There has been another step forward with the Oakland A's new stadium project. Two weeks ago, the Oakland Planning Commission voted to send the environmental impact report to the Oakland City Council, which you applauded as a huge win. But the A's have said they're continuing to look at Las Vegas as well for a new stadium. So what do you think? How much are you willing to do as mayor to keep the A's here? And what do you think, you know, no, you're not willing to do? Listen, I've been very clear about no public money for stadiums, and the A's have made that commitment. This is a privately financed ballpark. And to the extent that this is going to fuel the creation of an incredible waterfront neighborhood, 18 acres of public parks, thousands and thousands of jobs, and affordable housing that we need so much. So this is everything that as a mayor I could want. And the excitement around this ballpark district is helping us win huge grants from the federal government. You saw just days after Biden signed that infrastructure bill, Oakland was awarded $14.5 million to start making the mobility improvements to ensure that this project is successful and that we use it as um, a catalyst to make safety improvements. Uh, pollution reduction improvement, more equity to connect underserved communities with that incredible asset that is our waterfront. You do so have I some pushback excited. from the maritime community there, though, and some residents who are concerned about the vastness of this development. 
Listen, I have great respect for our maritime community. They look across the bay and see what happened to San Francisco's port, which really now is a real estate development corporation. Mm -hmm. That is not going to happen in Oakland. And we are continuing to listen to them, to put many protections in place, and to use this project as a catalyst to actually fund the protections for our port economy. It is the economic engine. Moving on, because we have so much to talk about, this week the Oakland School Board presented its plan to merge or close 15 schools. Now, a lot of that control rests in the hands of the school board. For you as a mayor, as the parent of a public school student, what do you feel is important to do to support the school system? You know, I really feel for parents, students, teachers, we have been through so much trauma and they have every right to feel distrustful and fearful about this decision. Uh, but I believe that it is different this time. This is not some just some painful but necessary budget cut. When you look at districts like Stockton, Fremont, San Jose, they serve roughly the same number of students, about 33,000, mm -hmm. but they do it in almost half the campuses, mm -hmm. uh, between 41 and 48 campuses in those three districts, whereas Oakland has 80 campuses. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity to do better for our students, our educators, our families, and I trust this leader to deliver on that promise in a way that has never happened before. Mayor Schaff, when you were mayor-elect, before you'd even taken office, you joined us here in the studio and you spoke with our political correspondent, Scott Schaefer, about your goals for policing in Oakland. Let's listen in to your thoughts at the time. Number one priority is public safety. That is something that Oakland has struggled with for a long time, and it's the most basic service that people deserve. Oaklanders need to feel confident that a cop will come when they call. They need to feel like their city is safe, and we need to make sure the rest of the world sees Oakland as a safe, vibrant, exciting city. Now, homicides in Oakland did see a steady decline for several years after you took office. They've climbed significantly in the past two years. The pandemic has had a huge part to play in that increase. Tell us about the highlights. Tell us about some moments that you feel like really made a difference and brought those levels down. It was a moment of, of awe to see that we actually could do it. Oakland cut gun violence in half and kept it there for several years. We were being written about in national publications. I was being invited to speak at national conferences about the Oakland miracle. And the pandemic just ripped all that progress away in such a heartbreaking fashion. And, and it's because the ceasefire approach, which is very comprehensive, uh, and, and it uses enforcement as a last resort, although it is a part of the strategy. Uh, so many aspects of it were kind of suspended or interrupted because of the pandemic. Now, uh, I will say that Oakland continues to be off the 10 most dangerous cities list, um, as far as I know. Uh, when I became the mayor, we had just been second on the list nationally. And so it's, it's no comfort to me, but the surge in gun violence that Oakland has experienced is not unique but I am cautiously optimistic that as the pandemic restrictions are being lifted, as we are beginning to return to our new normal, that this is a part of that. But you know, the stress, the, the sense of kind of anything goes because the world is ending, that continues to concern me. And that's a price we're gonna be paying from our school kids to our crime rates for a very long time. And You've described the Oakland Police Department over the years as a place with a toxic macho culture. That has been evidenced by scandal after scandal. Do you feel that in the seven years you've been mayor, you've made en enough change, as much change as you would have liked to have made? I mean, the o Oakland Police Department is still under federal receivership. Have we come far enough? Where do we need to get to? Priya, I believe in continual improvement and the work of 
making policing more progressive, more responsive to community will never end. I can say though, that this is an entirely different police department than the one that I met when I became the mayor. Uh, the culture, the leadership, uh, completely transformed. And I want to say that the federal judge uh, has recognized those amazing accomplishments. Uh, national, um, we are ranked first in the nation for having the biggest reductions in racial disparities in our arrests one of the lowest officer shooting rates year after year. These, uh, re these reforms are paying off when you look at Oakland in comparison to other major departments across the city. And I want to compliment our new police chief. He's creating a level of trust with the community. The fact that he is born and raised in Oakland and has so much trust built with community, uh, something that he himself has earned while working as a police officer has made a tremendous difference. Uh, now I am concerned with the attrition rate. I am excited about the new classes of recruits, especially a lot more born and raised in Oakland. Um, and that is something that we're gonna continue to do to grow kind of the next generation of police here in Oakland. Another recent initiative you launched is a universal basic income program in Oakland. Have you seen yet any data on how that program is doing? Do you expect you'll expand it before you leave office? Well, we just started the expansion. You know, we started with 300 families in a concentrated area of East Oakland. We actually just started cutting checks to a citywide cohort. We're doing two very rigorous evaluations, so we won't have that data until the evaluations are complete. But we have pulled out some storytellers like Alicia Rowe, uh, who is raising her grandson. And it is amazing to hear just the sense of well being people have when they get that extra $500 a month. The dignity, the lifting of stress, and the ability to start dreaming for their children or the children they're taking care of. And that is something we have heard from Alicia. We will be um, checking in with her and, and even giving the press an opportunity to hear in her own word how she has experienced a guaranteed income. And we're gonna be looking to see what its impacts can be in other ways both as part of the national movement. Uh, I'm a founding member of Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, and all these different demonstration projects are actually combining some of our evaluation data to look at a national trend. So you are in your final year in office. What do you have on your agenda? Well, Priya, there are some things that just need to get over that finish line, like the new ballpark at Howard Terminal, um, but I am not satisfied with three areas in this city. And I am really pushing my staff to move the needle on safety, on that crime rate, on homelessness, which has been a crisis, uh, particularly in California, that we have to address with so much more urgency. And then with the general state of cleanliness in our city, you know, I'm born and raised in Oakland, lived here all my life. I've never seen our city looking so dirty. And our ability to like catch these illegal dumpers, get people to help contribute to beautifying our public spaces. Uh, this is something that I am really gonna be doubling down on during this last year in office because everyone deserves a clean, beautiful, safe neighborhood. Mayor Libby Schaff, thank you for your time. Thank you, Priya. California's COVID case numbers are steadily improving after the Omicron surge took hold in December. The state now has a positivity rate of 13%, down from 20% two weeks ago, according to the state health department. Earlier this week, Governor Gavin Newsom announced that his administration will be releasing a new plan for the state's response to COVID-19 for when the pandemic becomes endemic. Newsom is also facing criticism, again, after photos surfaced of him and other politicians, including San Francisco Mayor London Breed, without masks on at the NFC Championship game in Los Angeles last Sunday in violation of SoFi Stadium rules. 
Joining me now are KQED Politics and Government Senior Editor Scott Schaefer. Hi, Scott. Hello. And the co-host of KQED's forum, Alexis Madrigal. Hi, Alexis. Hey, hello. So, Scott, let's start with you here. Have Governor Newsom and Mayor Breed been facing much backlash over these photos of them unmasked? In Mask weekend? gate. Mask gate. <laughs> Mask gate version 3.0. Yeah. Mean. You know, I think not the way, say, his dinner at French Laundry did, uh, but I think that, you know, it just it kind of undercuts his moral authority. You know, he has been asking people to put their masks on. He said, you know, that he had his mask in his left hand and just took it off to take that photo with Magic Johnson. But then, of course, within minutes of his saying that, other photos of him emerged. And I think, you know, I think in some ways he's just reflecting what a lot of us feel, which is fatigue Absolutely. in, in wearing masks yeah. and worrying about these things. Oh, I should point out that we have both been tested, so there's a reason <laughs> we're sitting here unmasked. <laughs> yeah, but I think all of us, you know, I know I've left the house without a mask. I'm like, oh, I got to go back to the house. And so I think if he had just said, look, like all of us, I'm you know tired of wearing a mask and I wanted to take a good photo, but instead he sort of went a little too far and he kind of got caught up in a lie, essentially. And so there's been criticism of him on that score. It's funny though, Mayor London Breed, I haven't heard much criticism about her and in a way, just like she also dined at French Laundry like a day after Newsom did, but he took the bullet for her politically, you know, and I think that's kind of happened here as well. All right. You know, Let's turn to, a, oh, Alexis, you want to get in on this? Yeah, sure. You know, I, I mean, I think I care less about the individual actions of these political actors. I, and what I really care about is, you know, what's that endemic plan going to look like? Because I, to me, endemic is starting to feel like one of those incantations, like herd immunity, hmm. that just comes to stand in for, oh, yeah, 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 everything is going to go back to normal. And I want to see a plan that actually gets us there, and I can't even imagine what that is. We should be seeing it in the next few weeks uh, from Governor Newsom. He, he also did make an announcement this week, not on COVID, but that the state is going to be dismantling death row at San Quentin. Alexis, do you want to start kick off this conversation about why this is happening. Yeah, sure. So, you know, death row prisoners have been held at San Quentin for a very long time. And it's a sort of separate part of the prison. And it's just where guys went to just sit and wait. Because for many years now, we haven't actually been doing executions. So the Newsom administration has put a moratorium on actually executing people. But you've had all these facilities kind of sitting there. You've had all these guys mm -hmm. being in very expensive, conditions in solo cells and not in with the rest of the general population. And so what is happening here is more like logistical. It's kind of a mechanistic move against the death penalty in that they're actually sort of dismantling the place where these guys are held and distributing them to other maximum security prisons around right. the state. Right. And Scott, you've been out to San Quentin. I know you saw Scott Peterson out there. Playing um, basketball, yeah. Playing basketball. And so what are your thoughts about this? Is this sort of a, just a, more evidence, as Alexis is sort of saying, we're not doing these sorts of things anyway? Yeah, I mean, it's been uh, 15, okay. 16 years since we've had an execution. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the ironic thing is because of court orders, California spent more than $800,000 a few years ago to upgrade the execution facility, which has never been used and may never be used. Um, you know, I think what's interesting to me is that the reason these inmates, as Alexis just said, are being transferred to other prisons is voters in, you know, I think it was 2016, passed Prop 66, which was supposed to expedite the death penalty. Of course, that hasn't worked. We still haven't had any executions. But it also required inmates on death row to work and that money that they would earn from work would be put into a fund for a restitution for victims. And so the state sort of used that as an you know, a reason to start whittling down the population on death row so they have been moved out. And as Gavin Newsom said the other day, that's just following the will of the voters. But I think it also really serves his own policy of trying to dismantle the death penalty mm -hmm. in California, which he can't do. The voters have to do that. Right. But in a sense, it isn't really happening. I should say that even though we haven't had an execution in, you know, 16 years, more than 100 inmates on death row have died during that period of time, mostly from natural causes, including COVID-19. There have been a few suicides and also some violent mm -hmm. deaths as well. So the few that are remaining, whoever is there now, they are going to these seven maximum security prisons in other places in California. Yeah, and it's still, you know, it's still a pretty big number. There are hundreds of, of men there. There's a small number of women in Chowchilla. That's a separate, uh, you know, facility, obviously. But I do think, you know, the the the, the death, people are split on the death penalty, and support for it has been going down. I think the concern, which I don't think is founded, is that some of these men who have been sentenced to death 
will ultimately get out of prison. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not what we're talking about here. They're going to, if anything, they will die in prison, but it just won't be from an execution. Well, you just went to a much more conservative part of California where support for the death penalty, for example, is high because you're following the story about a recall of a conservative supervisor up there who's being recalled from the right by a militia-led organization over COVID-19, over mask mandates, vaccine uh, mandates. So tell us about what you saw as you went up to Shasta County and what's happening there. Yeah, really interesting. Shasta County is a couple hours north of Sacramento, a very red county. It voted about 65% for Donald Trump in 2020. And so they, all five of their county supervisors are Republican, mm -hmm. but uh, three of them weren't Republican enough for some of the really extreme right-wing groups in the county, and that includes the militia, that includes the state of Jefferson people, a movement that wants to secede from the state of California. And so the militia and these other groups, anti-vaxxers as well, Second Amendment supporters uh, collected enough signatures to recall one of the supervisors, Leonard Modi, who describes himself as a Reagan Republican, uh, but which the recall supporters, they're calling him a rhino, Republican in name only. And as you say, he's pretty conservative. Certainly by San Francisco standards, he's like right wing, uh, former police chief of Reading. But uh, they put this recall on the ballot, and Tuesday was the election. They're still counting ballots, but it does look like he is going to be recalled. Okay. You know, Alexis, I want to come to you about a story with a guest that you had on this week. Uh, it really spoke to me in particular because this week in the legislature, we ended the thought that single-payer health care might come into play anytime soon. There was a single-payer health care bill carried by Assembly member Ash Kalra. That did not make it out of the Assembly. It's been attempted in the past, but there's a huge cost associated with this sort of program that generally seems to keep it from progressing. But the connection for me with your story this week was on Forum. You had a guest on who talked about the link between poverty, not enough money, and how a baby's brain develops, right? So we're talking about public health and how we look at using our money for the health of people in California. This was a really interesting interesting experiment that happened. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about what they found there. Sure, I mean, I think it's a really fascinating study. Just the result on its face is is kind of mind blowing. I mean, basically you give a set of mothers $333 a month and you give another set of mothers $20 a month. And then you put their babies in an EEG and you measure their brain waves and you actually find a biologically detectable difference between the babies whose mothers got $333 wow. and the one mother's got $20. I mean, the big question is, we don't really know the mechanism for that. Is it that the mothers have more money so there's better nutrition? Do they spend more time with their children because they have to work less? And this is like the first pebble in a whole, uh, whole uh, rock field of papers that are going to come out about this particular study, which is called Baby's First Years. And mm. it really helps show that by alleviating, alleviating poverty, by just making people less poor, you improve the cognitive development of their children. And it's, you know, part of the whole universal basic income debate. It's part of just the idea that we can't separate our socioeconomic circumstances from our health and our development. Mm -hmm. Alexis, what else is coming up for you in this coming week? What are you looking at? What are you thinking about as, as this week sure. ends and you're going into the next? We well, you know locally there's a huge debate, very heated going on in Oakland about the closure of some public schools. And so for us, we're trying to figure out who are the right voices who can speak to the various sides of that debate. And then kind of on the other end of the scale, globally, we're pretty interested in what's happening in Ukraine. We're following it very closely. And we think we're probably gonna take an angle looking at some of the cyber attacks that are occurring there at the Ukraine-Russia uh, border. Okay, so that'll be Forum at 9 next week. Scott, what about you? What's coming up for you next week? Well, this is the final week before the Fe February 15th election to recall three school board members and s decide who's going to fill out the rest of David Chu's assembly mm -hmm. uh, seat. So we're looking at that. Um, and then also President Biden said he's going to name a new uh, Supreme Court nominee. Uh, it's going to be a black woman, Leandra Kruger from the uh, California Supreme Court is on the short list, so we're keeping an eye out for that. It's going to happen in February sometime. We don't know if it's going to be next week, but we're definitely keeping an eye out for that as well. Okay. Scott Schaefer with KQED. We appreciate it. Good yeah. to hear about what's going on in your world. Alexis Madrigal, thank you so much for being on our show. This is your very first, you know, <laughs> inaugural visit here to KQED <laughs> Newsroom. Thanks for having me. It has been excellent. Thank you both. Thank you. This week's Something Beautiful is the Oakland Zoo's annual Glofari, where larger-than-life animals 
prowl the grounds in lantern form alongside the zoo's usual critters. If you missed it this time, Glowfari will be back in November. To our viewers, we want to thank you for continuing to write in. On last week's show, we discussed a rebounding growth in the population of monarch butterflies. In response, we received this message from Rosario, who said she and others in the East Bay have been working to help the butterflies thrive. I would like to share with you that in San Leandro, California, many of us are planting in our yards milkweed. Monarch butterflies look for this plant in order to lay their eggs. I keep them safe in cages that I made with tool and zippers until they emerge and are ready to fly. That's the end of our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. If you want to get a look behind the scenes, then please hang out with us online too. KQED Newsroom is on Twitter and Facebook. Or email your comments to us like Rosario did at knr at kqed.org. You can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. We'll see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend.